All right, all right, let's get started on this thing. Okay, so a few days ago, we made a video uh, on this blog post that I saw by Modular. Um, and uh, it's Mojo is 50% faster than Rust, right? And I read it, and there were some, like, skeptical remarks, and, hey, you're doing this, and, hey, you're doing something else, and, hey, you're not correct on this. And they literally came back, and first off, they quoted me. I will say one thing. Um, I was an individual. I wasn't a group of people, okay? I am not an – and second off, I'm not sure if I would call myself an expert, okay? I use Rust regularly, wouldn't call myself an expert, but I still agree with my sta- with my statement. Uh, anywho, so follow up to the articles, they actually wrote a response to everything, and they're saying that they're actually is it actually faster? This quote has been flying around everywhere for Mojo. <laughs> I think it's the best quote. I, honestly, I fully agree with my quote. So for those that don't know what my quote was uh, or didn't really understand it when they saw it, it's very very simple. If Python can remain Python. You have to learn a little bit extra, like some extra APIs, a little bit of extra syntax for some basic declaration and all that. And you can have effectively the benefits of performance of Rust. Then everybody that's in AI that is doing these fast, small experiments, throwaway code and everything, they're going to stick with Python or in this case, Mojo. They're not going to make the migration over to Rust. And I think that that's still absolutely true. Anyone that thinks that somebody who's trying to do these really fast, really guerrilla experiments and throw away everything they make, why would they ever try to go and learn Rust and spend this incredible amount of time getting good at it just to do that one thing, right? It just doesn't make any sense. It it, it, it doesn't, it like, it, it doesn't feel like a good, a good argument. Anyways, So let's go into this one. This is their response because obviously they got called out saying, hey, you did all these things wrong. So let's find out what they have to say. Mojo is built on the latest compiler technology in MLIR, an evolution on LLVM, which Rust lowers to. And so it can be faster. It depends largely on the skill of the programmer and how far they're willing to go with optimizations. Classic skill, classic skill issues. Isn't that all performance skill issues and uh, trade-offs because your boss wanted it yesterday? Isn't that like most skill issues? Dude, right now I'm dealing with a skill issue uh, involving performance, which is literally just a massive performance black hole. And simply that's just because things had to get done and they had to get done quickly. I mean, that's honestly, that's that's such a huge part of the professional world is just people ain't got time to make the greatest thing ever. And so if it's if it's a pretty fast, easy path to make something good enough, a lot of people are happy. Mojo's goal as a language is to meet Python developers where they are and allow them to learn some new tricks to optimize their code to the performance limits of any hardware. See, this is what I mean. I don't see how you're ever going to be able to win this argument. If you could just immediately get benefits, why would you change anything, right? Dude, I would program. If Mojo ends up being as good as they, as they are, if Modular has perfectly sold us a, like, assuming everything they say is great, hell, I'm going to probably start looking into using Mojo all the time. You know what I mean? Over the weekend, Netflix engineer and Rust advocate, hell yeah, hell yeah, that's me. Let's go. Um released a re- reaction video to the community guest blog we published outperforming rust dna sequencing parsing parsing benchmarks by 50 percent with mojo uh by the way i do i mean i i do advocate for using rust i think it makes like honestly if you write an lsp and you don't use rust i think you are a bad person or you wrote go please which is an incredible is the best lsp ever created if you write an lsp in in, in javascript you're you're being a bad person stop it stop it Stop it. Um, They're blaming me. The blog post stirred up some uh, controversies. Uh, Rust uh, is being positioned as the potential successor to the dominant language in AI, which is currently Python and C++. This is the Brimage's take on Mojo. Okay, yes. If Mojo is, I did not, I didn't imply legitimate. Okay, I think I said, I thought I said if Mojo is like giving it, okay, whatever. If Mojo is legitimate, I think Mojo will win, just hands down. The reason Mojo will win, if you... By the way, this is live streaming. I don't, I mince my words maybe a little bit while live streaming. Is you don't change the paradigm of any acclimated or professional individual. You just have to learn a bit more and you get amazing performance. If Mojo compiles fast and it looks like a language you're already familiar with and it's really close to being at the same speed, I just don't see how you're going to make that sell for Rust. Pre read, pre stated, and then even Luca. Yeah, Luca agreed with me. By the way, great book. I already, he said thank you because I, I promote his book on the regular, but I do mean it. Here, hold on one second. 
Literally. What, probably the best, uh, one of the best Rust books. If you're vaguely familiar with Rust and you kind of already understand how the borrow checker works, buy the book. It's fantastic. I won't even give, I, I literally will not give anybody a Amazon affiliate code. Just go buy it. I'm not going to make money off that one because it's too good of a book. All right, catching on the Prime Division stream for, uh, from yesterday, Mojo versus Rust. He's right. If Mojo delivers, he did, he, did, he did make some specifications that they're not saying here. If Mojo delivers, we'll never see Rust in user space for people working on AI. The value proposition is just too good. If you're an ML engineer or data scientist who knows Python well, it is a great, yeah, it is. The value proposition is just simply too good. But by user space, I mean data scientists, data analysis, ML researcher, tinkers. All folks who need to validate an idea and or build a prototype that's good enough to be shipped. Uh, they are the lion's share of the AI world. A bit like compiler engineers versus web devs. Depending on how much Mojo delivers, M Rust might struggle to settle in AI infrastructure space too. That's the big one, is if, if Mojo's good enough to also settle into AI infrastructure... That's gonna be sweet. By the way, you could, uh, you could, you could. Uh, by the way, you can just link. You can just link. Yeah, I, I, I have zero rules in my chat. Okay, I just ban people for being assholes. Okay, you can link. I, I assume you're. I assume most people aren't assholes, and they'll just do the right thing. And then there's a couple dickheads, and you just you make a game out of banning them. Right? It's fun. All right, so Mojo, our goal. Our aim is to be intuitive to learn for Python developers. As Muhammad showed, he was able to learn Mojo and optimize an algorithm using SIMD in a matter of weeks as a side project. While this article is focused on performance differences, the points that Primogen and Luca uh, Palmieri made are important to us. We, we are heavily focused on AI, where a three-language problem exists. Ooh, the three-language problem. A menage et language. Uh, we are heavily focused on AI, where there is a three-body problem, uh, and where CPU plus GPU programmability is so important across hardware. But let's not forget the real goal of Mojo is lifting the world's most popular AI language in Python and empowering developers everywhere with incredible performance, hardware uh, portability, and programmability. Is Mojo faster than X language? Uh, raised an important question. Rust is known for low-level performance. How can Mojo provide better performance out of the box than Rust or C++? I, I assume it can't. I assume by the very definition that it should not be able to, but it will be able to, or it will be able to compete on par with specific things, right? So a very simple example would be a for loop, a for loop doing some amount of work. They should be able in some sense, one would assume you'd be able to do that. But at the end of the day, I assume this is still, there's still garbage collection going on, right? It's just like Go will never be as fast as Rust, but Go can be really fast, if that makes sense. We're going to let them cook. Don't worry. We're going to let them cook. I'm just explaining. I'm explaining a very simple principle that people seem to not realize about programming languages, which is very, very simple. There's like a pyramid of languages. There is like your, uh, there is like your peer, pretty much your like peer interpreted languages, right? And so you got things like Lua, Lua if you don't use Lua JIT. Right. Um, then you got yourselves like the slow interpreted languages like Python and Ruby. Then you got yourself the Google has paid $10 billion to make it fast language, JavaScript. Right. Then you got yourself compiled but still garbage collected languages such as Java and Go. Right. These are these are faster languages. They tend to be a lot faster. Java kind of falls. Java somewhere between these two because Java has the ability to kind of compile, but it also bytecodes, so it's also interpreted. But then it's also, you know, Java's in a weird spot. We're we're gonna put Java in between these two. But Go is like a purely compiled language, but it has it, it has no jitting, right? But it does. Oh, C sharp I think falls under the same platform as Java, right? So C sharp. Right, it it is both compiled and there's some sort of interpretation thing going on there. I don't I don't know the exact lines in which things happen, uh, but I know you have to warm up endpoints and shit like that. Uh, but go on the other hand, there's no warming up. It's just fast, but it's garbage collected, so it's not perfectly fast. Then you got things like C. Uh, Rust and C++. This makes total sense that these guys are always on the tip. Wow, just the tip because they are compiled and you manage the memory. So assuming you don't have skill issues, you should be going fast. Does that make sense? Oh, assembly, assembly it falls under this. C is just fancy assembly. Okay, sure. You're right, assembly, Fortran. People don't, COBOL, COBOL falls under this. We're not gonna talk about those ones, okay? Because those aren't interesting. Very few people do assembly. Uh, okay. And the people that are doing assembly and should be doing a zig isn't okay. Shut. Oh my goodness. Yes, we get it. 
the compiled managed memory are the ones in which fall into the l most elite category of speed, okay? Because they have the what they have the most possibility of being fast. It doesn't mean they are the fastest in all situations. They just have the possibility of being the fastest, but you suffer from skill issues way more frequently. The the line of potential skill issues go up really, really fast. And so like there's a graph that exists, right? So when it comes to uh, Ruby, uh, this is like uh, this would be like speed and this would be uh, skill issues, right? So this is speed and skill issues. Ruby goes like this cuz there's no skill issues, it's just slow, right? That's just how it goes. JavaScript, you know, the speed and skill issues, there's there's definitely like a line here. You can make JavaScript fast, but most people just suffer too heavily from from skill issues. Actually, the the line would be like this, right? It's really hard to get right. Whereas like Go, you can have skill issues and you can be pretty fast. Rust though tends to be like this as well. To make Rust fast, you have to be pretty good. Same with C++, same with those other languages, because you have to, like, not suffer from skill issues to make it good. So I always find that Go just has, like, just the right amount. Still can goof yourself up, but you can make it pretty fast. So I'm hoping that Mojo falls right here. Honestly, this is what I hope. I hope Mojo falls on the Go line. If Mojo falls on the Go line, then it's out of this world. Right? It's a great, great, great thing. A common question when you, uh, users first join the Discord is how much faster is Mojo than X language? There's a lot of considerations surrounding any benchmark implementation. You can't choose any one benchmark to say X language is faster than Y language. This is, by the way, very good on them to do this. People constantly say these dumb things about languages being faster, and then what they what they do is they show you like an HTTP request that does empty echoing of like hello world, and that is just totally not, totally not good. Totally not good. Um, a better question is how much overhead does Mojo introduce compared to X? Better. A major goal for Mojo is to allow you to push hardware to the limits of physics while remaining ergonomic and familiar to Python developers. Compared to the dynamic languages, uh, language like Python, compiled languages allow you to remove unnecessary CPU instructions such as allocating objects to the heap, reference counting, and periodic garbage collection. We covered that. Mojo takes lessons learned uh, and best practices from C++, Rust, and Swift to provide direct access to machine without these kind of overheads. Okay. Mojo and Rust both allow you to optimize at a lower level, but in Rust, for example, you can still wrap everything in an Arc Mutex box. Okay. Please. I mean, this is... How many people write a bunch of Rust and make it really awesome and do all these great things only to end with an Arc Mutex hash map? Come on. Come on. Come on, don't lie to me. You know, you know, you little sons of bitches end with an Arc Mutex uh, hash map, okay? Don't even, don't even lie. Explain to me like I'm five what an Arc and a, Arc and a Mutex is. Yes, yeah, so Arc stands for automatic, ref, or it stands for reference counting at the atomic level, meaning that you can pass it between threads because what they count, uh, or effectively what is cloned, is 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 pretty much a pointer to where your data is. And the counter for how many people are holding onto that data is atomic. So that means if two threads try to increment at the same time, it will appropriate, appropriately increment it by two. Whereas if you had just an RC and you tried to do that, you could very well have two people incrementing uh, two at the exact same time. Thus, it's three, even though two people have ownership. So it's a reference counter. So it'll count how many people hold onto an object. A mutex is like a single lane road. Only one car can pass at a time. That's the easiest way to think about a mutex. And so that means only one person can hold on to the mutable access to an object. So if you had a hash map and you wanted to uh, mutate it, you'd want to use a mutex. A semaphore is just a mutex that has a wide road, if that makes sense. It can allow four people to, to do something at a time, or eight, or 12, or however many you want. You can now explain it to me like I'm four because I'm too dumb to be five. No. Uh, to avoid fights with the borrow checker at the cost of performance, if you're writing an application code, this might not have any significant impact, but if you're writing a library or performance-sensitive code, the overhead can add up quickly. It's up to the pro programmer how much they care about reducing overhead and optimizing performance. Fair. Fair take. This is a very fair take. Both, uh, let's see, both of the languages can use LLVM for optimized code gen, and both languages can, uh, let's see, allow for the use of inline assembly. But of course, no one can afford to do that. <laughs> what is this tweet? 
Agree. You can match perf with inline assembly argument is funny. It implies that the language doesn't matter at all, but obviously the world can't afford to rewrite all software for chip slash variants. Even more true with shift, uh, shift to accelerators, which Mojo is built for. Yes, this makes sense. So someone obviously made the argument uh, that you can do you can be faster if you use a hand roll assembly. And it's just like, yeah, you can do that, but that's dumb. And it's true. It's true. It is dumb. Like there should be only like, I know TLS does it with their crypto stuff. There's like some hand rolled uh, crypto algorithms out there. And that makes sense. But most people ain't doing that. So they both have the same potential uh, on traditional hardware, right? Well, sure. But the real question is, how does the performance of idiomatic slash normal Mojo code compare to normal Rust code written by someone who isn't a world expert writing in assembly for every chip and doesn't know the details of how the compiler works? This is a much better question, by the way. What does the, what does the six-month writer of code look like? And when I say idiomatic, I don't, you know... Idiomatic is funny because unless if you have a very strict way in which all code is formatted and expected to be written, there is no really such thing as idiomatic. There's like localized idio idiomatices, idiomatics, right? So if you look at uh, jo if you look at JavaScript, there you could see these idiomatic lines. I can look at a library and tell you which five year period something was written in. And so if I look at certain things, it's very e – like early JavaScript, it was all about using that extends and classes and prototypical inheritance. And you can be like, oh, this was idiomatic JavaScript at one point for some set of people. Anyways, this is a really great thing. So what would the six-month person look like? Reduced mem copy with borrow by default. When a new user is learning Rust, one of the first pitfalls they run into is that function arguments default to taking an object by moving it. This means that you pass something into a function and try to reuse it. You get a compiler error. Correct, but it's also beautiful. I love this. So, uh, I actually really this is what I, I actually do enjoy this level of the borrow checker. I find it to be very very useful in how I think about things. The line with debug throws a compile error because you've moved foo into bar function. Uh, this th because debug y uses foo, so that's why this thing breaks. Whereas bar uh, bar also effectively takes ownership of foo because he didn't pass it by reference uh for those that don't know rust rust is a little bit wild okay javascript is a bad example there is no idiomatic uh only different levels of idiotic <laughs> idiotic <laughs> yes the mem copy can be optimized away by llvm in some cases but this doesn't always occur and is hard to predict unless you know how the rust llvm compiler works mojo simplifies this concept for a standard use case right main foo string uh, bar print foo mojo uh, arguments are borrowed by default not only is this much more gentle when learning mojo compared to rust it's also much uh, more efficient due to no implicit mem copies if you want to get closer to rust behavior you can change the argument to uh to owned i didn't even know that this was like a thing owned what is owned i don't even i i i'm not i'm clearly not an expert I, i've never used this as a keyword I never, I've never once used this as a keyword. Have you guys used that as a keyword? I have like, I have never seen it. I've never seen it in any arguments. Oh, this is Mojo. Oh shit! No wonder I was just like, dude, I've never seen this. What is this Rust? No wait, this is not. Wait, fuck, this is, this is Mojo. I, dude, I can't tell the difference. You can't use F. You both can't use FN. They're both using FN. Okay, this is Mojo. This is Mojo. Okay, nice, nice. Sorry, my bad, my bad. Oh, this is cool, by the way. I, I do want to say something about this. So this is very OCaml-y, meaning that you're sending an explicit message about the variable, but you're not tying it. You're not tying a lifetime as part of its type. Does that make sense? So one thing that Rust does that's very, you can call it frustrating, is that a reference is effectively part of its type, which means that you have colored types. Whereas this, whereas OCaml and now apparently uh, Mojo is that they're orthogonal, which is really nice. It's very, very, very nice. Like this is, I, I think this is one of the greatest things ever because that means the, you know, the outside can make a bunch of uh, assumptions about this, meaning that, okay, this thing could be stack allocated due to how it's being used. Really cool. Whereas all, like all dynamic languages you usually can't make that and everything has to be heap allocated, but this one's being very explicit about it. 
Uh, this still works because string implements a copy constructor. It is able to move into bar and leave behind a copy. Under the hood, this is still passing a reference for maximum efficiency, but it only creates a copy of foo if mutated. To fully opt into, uh, so that's called a cow, copy on right. Uh, or, or To cop, uh, fully opt into Rust default of moving an object and losing ownership, you need to use the operator, whatever this is. Cool. Honestly, this is cool. Now you finally get a compiler error for uh, trying to use foo after a move, and you have to work much harder to fight the borrow checker in Mojo. This is better default behavior. Not only is it more efficient, it does it doesn't uh, roadblock engineers from dynamic programming backgrounds. They still get the behavior they expect by default with the best performance possible. I mean, I, to, to me, this is a little bit of a weak argument in the sense that uh, you're kind of like people would just use a reference here, dog. They'd use and stir, right? They had answered that son of a bee. So, eh, you know what I mean? Eh, you know what I mean? Like, eh, kind of feel, eh, kind of feels a little, you know, boilerplate rust though. But then again, uh, but then again, you also have a lot of these types that you have to think about and blah, 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 blah. And then if this thing has to be held on to longer for some amount of time, then you run into lifetimes and anyways. All right. No pin requirement in rust. Okay. Every time I've asked somebody that understands what pin is, they can't ever explain what pin is. They can just tell you how you should use it. It's very, very funny how pin is like one of the most loosely understood concepts of Rust, as far as I can tell. Pin is, is saying whether or not it can be moved in memory, is all it is. So there's unpin and pin. I believe that's like the, the fundamental basis of it. A pin equals can't move. Exactly. But to explain that to why you need it and and all those things and how it actually performs it and all the, that stuff, it feels very confusing. In Rust, there is no concept of value identity. For a self-referential struct pointing to its own member, the data can become invalid if the object moves, as it'll be pointing to the old memory location. This creates a complexity spike, particularly in parts of async Rust where futures need to be self-referential in store state. You must wrap self with pin to guarantee that it's not going to move. By the way, this might... Somehow Mojo just made one of the best explanations of, of pin or of pin they're doing a pretty good job in mojo objects have an identity so referring to self.foo always returns to the correct location in memory without additional complexity required for the programmer uh there is a nice blog titled pin and suffering which we've read that takes you on a journey of a rustation working through the implications of pin these are complexities that a magician i didn't mean to press that i was just so disappointed by people who program mojo calling them magicians okay i'm not i'm just saying i think you should come up with a different word okay just saying i'm i am i am furious right i'm fear i'm i'm fuming i'm fuming right now um all right rust was started in 2006 and swift was started in 2010 um and both are primarily built on top of ll of em ir mojo started in 2022 and built on l uh, mlir which is mo more modern next generation compiler stack than LLVM IR approach that Rust uses. Okay, so there could just be, but this is like a, uh, one could argue that this is a eventually fixable problem. Mojitos, there you go, I like that, mojitos. This is a, an eventually fixable problem. There is a history here. Our CEO, Chris Latner, started LLVM in college in December 2000 and learned a lot from its evolution and development over the years. He then led the development of MLIR at Google to support their TPU and other AI accelerator projects, taking that learning from LLVM IR to build the next step forward, described in this talk from 2019. Okay, so he may know a thing or two, as it sounds like. Mojo is the first programming language to take advantage of all the advances in MLIR, both to produce more optimized uh, CPU code generation, but also to support GPUs and other accelerators, and to have much faster compile times than Rust. Let's go. D get dunked on. I think, actually, this is a very important part. If you're doing a bunch of really, uh, if you're doing a lot of really fast iteration, Rust can become just annoying. And I don't want to sound like a diva, which I will sound like a diva. Compile times can take the joy out of programming sometimes. I get like compile allergic sometimes. You know, it's one reason, again, why my Go arc, I've been loving my Go arc because there's just like, you just, there's just, compile times are transparent. You know, it's just really enjoyable.
Uh, this is the, let's see, this is an advantage that no other language currently provides. And it's why a lot of AI and compiler nerds are excited about Mojo. Fire! Uh, they can uh, build their fancy abstractions for exotic hardware, while us mere mortals can take advantage of them with Pythonic syntax. G uh, great SIMD ergonomics. CPUs have special registers and instructions to process multiple bits of data at the same time, known as SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. But the ergonomics of writing this code has historically been very ugly and difficult to use. Yeah, it's wild. Every time I see SIMD code, I'm like, duh. Uh, these special instructions have been around for many years, but most code is still not optimized for it. When someone works through the complexities and writes portable SIMD optimized algorithm, it blows the competition out of the water. For example, SIMD JSON. That's real. That's what uh, V8 uses, and that's why often, I mean, it's amazingly fast. Uh, Mojo's primitives are natively designed to be SIMD first. Uint8 is actually a SIMD D type Uint81, which is a SIMD, uh, SIMD one of one element. There is no performance overhead to represent it this way, but it allows the programmer to easily use it for SIMD optimizations. That's actually pretty cool. Okay. Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, so maybe Mojitions might be okay. Maybe Mojitions, Mojo has uh, too many types. What? Can you ever have too many types? For example, you can split up the text into 64 byte blocks and represent it as SIMD type UNT864, then compare it to a single new line character in order to find the index for every new line. Because the SIMD registers on your machine can calculate operations on 512 bits of data at the same time, this will improve performance of those operations by 64x. I don't know if it's like literally 64. I mean, like, yeah, like in, in, in like the, the, the peer scope of that. Yeah. But there, I mean, I'm sure it's not like a peer 64 X always win. There's probably some, some coefficient sounds like a skill issue. It does sound like a skill issue, but also not having to like write out all that shit also sounds really fantastic. Uh, some more examples of SIMD type float 64, eight, two, four, whatever you can multiply a float by float. Let's see by, let's see. You can multiply it by float. Uh, two, improving performance by eight on most machines compared to multiplying each element individually. So that is like, I mean, this is super cool. Honestly, this is super cool in the sense that you're able to do very simple operations. You know, I mean, just think about matrix multiplication, right? That's, I mean, I think that's what you got to have in your mind when you think about this, like vector operations. And so if you just say they're int eights and it just does it for you like there is something that's really good about that right it's really really good about that well it's not just great for ml these same ideas can also probably be i assume they can be translated to some game programming math as well uh lovm and therefore rust has automatic vectorization optimization passes but they'll never be able to reach the same level of performance as the programmer expressing exactly what they intend because lovm cannot change memory layout or other important details for simd mojo has built from the ground up to take advantage of simd and writing simd optimizations feels very close to writing normal code all right eager destruction rust was inspired by ray resource acquisition is initialization resource acquisition is initialization resource acquisition is initialization don't forget, they also go inverted. Uh, so, you know, your destructors go backwards. Uh, the interesting part about this is that they aren't focusing on uh, solving the automatic parallelism problem. They're going straight for uh, to instruction parallelism. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Preach, dude. C++ doctrine. Yeah, thank you for coming to my C++ sermon and implicitly Rust sermon uh, from C++, which means that once an object goes out of scope, the application developer doesn't have to worry about freeing the memory. The programming language takes care of it. This is really nice paradigm, and you get ergonomics of dynamic language without the performance drawbacks of a garbage collector. Exactly. Mojo uh, takes this one step further. I am curious about something, though, with this. Like, is it always faster? And hear me out on this one. This is why I assume they do like arena uh, arena allocations and and you, do, you 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 pretty much write your own allocators to avoid some of this. Where if you're always deallocating as it's running, is that better or worse than having something like a garbage collector that can deallocate a bunch of things at once? Maybe it's like you know, there's obviously a trade off. We all know the trade off. I'm just saying. I wonder what the distributed efficiency versus the you know point efficiency is. I have no idea. I just assume allocating is more expensive. It's uh, allocating is more expensive in GCs because you have to allocate bookkeeping memory along with the thing itself. And then deallocating can be more expensive because it has to crawl a bunch of stuff. Better throughput, but worse overall. That's what that would be my assumption is better throughput, but, but worse overall, right? Like maybe it's, if you take a time period, it's better. 
But then if you take a time period long enough, it becomes worse. And that makes sense. Mojo takes one step further. Instead of waiting until the end scope, it frees memory on the last use of the object. This, adv this is advantageous in the field of AI, where freeing an object early can mean deallocating a GPU tensor early, therefore fitting a larger model in GPU RAM. This is a unique advantage for Mojo, where the programmers gets the best possible outcome without having to think about it. The Rust borrow checker originally extended the lifetime of everything to the end of its scope to match the destructor behavior, which has some confusing consequences for users. Rust added new features to simplify this for developers with non-lexical lifetimes. Due to Mojo's eager destruction, we get these simplifications for free and it aligns with how objects are actually destroyed so we don't have uh, confusing edge cases. I'm not going to lie to you, Mojo's making really powerful arguments here. I really like that this is no longer like a 50% faster article, but instead this is like a, here are our trade-offs we are making, and there's reasons why this is better and worse. And I think, I mean, always garbage collection will always be worse than not garbage collection. I think everybody agrees with that statement. But I, I really like some of these things it's saying. I think it just makes it, 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 it means that it's, it's going to be fast. Now, is it going to be absolutely faster than Rust? My guess is probably not. Uh, if you have like, you know, expert in both categories, but I'd love, again, I really think a great measurement is take somebody with six months of familiarity and both person gets thrown at a problem and see what comes out of it. Right. Then I want you to also take I want you I want a boss to be over each one of those two people. And I want them to also be in like, hey, you need to hurry up. Hey, we got deadlines. Hey, we got people that are waiting for you. Hey, we got this. And I want to see what the outcome of that code is. You know what I mean? Because anybody can make the world's most optimized code given enough time and effort. But can you do it under pressure, under you know, real world working conditions? All right, tail call optimization. Oh, yeah, here we go. Another piece of overhead is the way that drop works in Rust. It t tracks if an object should be dropped at runtime with drop flags. Rust can optimize these away in some cases, but Mojo defines them away categorically to eliminate the overhead in all cases. Okay. Okay, okay. There, let's see. Uh, there isn't much tr uh, of a trade-off being described, right? They're explaining how uh, fast Mojo is because tech, trademark, but it's not describing what trade-offs they are making. Well, I mean, their claim was that representing something as a SIMD int contains no overhead change, but has the do like opens the door to easier use of SIMD. All right, can we stop for a moment and recognize that this is also free, good Python compiler? Facts. That's basically hotspot elimination. Mojo is using. Well, Mojo is going to use a, uh, if it's if it's Pythonic in nature, it's going to use a garbage collector. It has to. Uh, due to the previous, I assume it has to. I may be wrong there, but I just assume. Tail call optimization and elimination, TCO and TCE. Uh, due to previous point about not having eager destruction in Rust, if something is allocated inside a recursive function, the destructure won't run until the end of the scope, which means that tail call optimizations and eliminations are off the table. Here's a minimal example that you can run yourself. Uh, first function, new cargo Rust, looks like this. Again, I don't know how true these numbers are, but that is wild. I mean, that is wild. So, so hold on. So Rust doesn't have tail call optimization? Is that true? It does? It's, yeah, I know. Then, then what? I don't get it. Uh, personal, hold on. Is there is there a cargo knit? Can I provide a name? Uh, uh. Say, say what? What 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 just happened here? Oh. What, hold on. What, what is this supposed to? What, hold on. What is happening here? Like, what? What are they asking for? Remo remove these generics. Okay. Why are you? Why are you? Why are you being like that? 
I, I thought you could turbo fish that side. Are you not able to turbo fish that side? Expect a type. What is this type? What are you asking? What are you even asking me? Uh, with capacity. Oh, I left those in. I'm a stupid person. Okay, so they didn't have a type on it, so it, it blew up. Is that like some new feature that I'm not uh, that I'm not not aware of? Okay, so I can do that. Cargo uh, run release. Uh, just make sure I I, I did see that. Uh, yeah. All right. Oh my goodness, I I actually went to a different NeoVim instance. Uh, I32, there you go. Okay, so it, it's definitely running these things. I mean, even if I throw a little time in there, I guess I don't, I, what, what are they using to run and do the uh, hyperfine? I don't have hyperfine. So I don't have hyperfine. Yeah, uh, I don't have hyperfine. Just pseudo apt install, right? Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Just pseudo apt install. A super a pseudo apt install hyperfine. Isn't that how you do it? Let's find out if that works. Uh, what am I supposed to, uh, let's see, uh, cargo build, release. I just wanted to make sure that I was actually running the thing. Okay, release, hyper, fine. And what do they have here? Uh, build, target, uh, CD target. Oh, here, I'm going to take that. Uh, hyper, fine, uh, target, release, uh, foo. Okay, well, I'll be damned. I don't, so, so the problem is, is I don't know what, why this thing can't, um, I don't know why this thing can't be, is it, is it, is it because this thing is allocated on the stack and therefore it can't be tail call optimized? Is that what they're saying? I don't, I don't really, uh, the problem is I don't really understand exactly how tail call optimization works other than it, it literally, it literally like unrolls it into a loop, uh, instead of having to allocate a new stack frame per function call. Uh, read the text above. That's why they say why. Yeah, yeah, I saw I saw that because they don't have eager destruction, therefore it won't work. I don't have Mojo installed, so I can't actually, I can't actually pr prove this to be true. But you know what we can do? Since we're already here, we, I mean, we might as well, you know, we might as well just go like this, uh, index.js. Let's, let's try this out. Let's, uh, let's try this out in the old, um, Let's see how let's see how JavaScript does, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If uh, if x equals zero, oh yeah. I was like, why can't I see why this is a problem? There we go. Fantastic. Uh, all right. Let's let's see how let's see how uh, Node does. Uh, let's go like this. Let's go Node um, source. Why, why, why can't I do, what just happened there? That was weird. The fuck? <laughs> okay, that doesn't, that can't, that like literally can't make sense. Okay, that can't make sense. Yeah, I was about to say, there's the, the, just it, it, that can't actually make sense. Okay, that was just launching Node. Okay, H how do I make this? Do I have to like? Okay, here. Uh, do I have to create like a? I have to create like a run script. Is that what they're asking me to do? Uh, a Node index. I mean, this is this is at this point. There's no way that this will be faster, right? There's just no way, right? It, There you go. There ain't no way that could be faster. Right? It has to be. It has to be orders of magnitude worse because we're starting up multiple processes. It's gonna. It has. It has to, by the very definition, be like way worse. Why? Command terminated. Why? 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 
I hate Bash. Sorry, sorry, bad cop. I hate Bash. Okay, I hate Bash. I hate Bash. I don't I don't even want to hear about it. Maximum call. <laughs> okay, well, Node didn't win. This Node did not win. Node did not win the argument. Increase RAM. Maximum old space increase. Okay, well. Can you try drop stuff before? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, let's, let's do, yeah, okay, we'll do one more little, one more little search. Drop stuff. Let's throw that in there, okay? Uh, let's go like this. Let's go cargo, build release. Hyperfine. Appears to be no difference here. If you aren't using VEC with capacity, but normal VEC new, it's faster. I have no idea why. There must be, there must be a reason why that is. There's some there's something that goes on where you allocate an array with capacity that changes how it, how it goes on there. So I can't say I understand that with a capacity pre allocates sure, but so is, I mean new new allocates what five slots. But look, I mean they're doing they're doing something very similar. They're saying hey, create an int with forty two slots in it. Right, so I mean, they're they're also creating a similar sized thing. So it's not like so it's not like it's not like they're cheating. I don't think new allocates one. I don't believe you on that. I don't believe you at all. New does oh vec new does not allocate until push is called. I wonder what they're doing. So that so that's actually a really so that would actually be super interesting. It's it's just super interesting to think about, which is what does this actually allocate? Because if this actually allocates and allocates everything to that size, then that's really impressive, right? But then why use with capacity? They're using with capacity to show you something, right? You do with capacity if you want to create a vector that does not resize itself. It's called dynamic vector for a reason. It doesn't allocate. That's not true. It's dynamic allocator or a dynamic vector, and it has a size associated with it. I'm, I, one would assume that its capacity is respected, okay? Yeah, I, with capacity resizes itself. Yeah, I would assume it resizes itself to the size that you pass in, but starts at 42. Again, I would assume that all happens. Uh, Anyways, okay, so this is very interesting. There's something going on here that I think we don't understand. But we do know that when you say with capacity, Rust clearly respects the fact that it's with capacity, but it has implications. If you if you don't do that, then it does not allocate. Therefore, it's just effectively a stack whatever, and it can go by pretty quick. I'm just curious what they're doing. We don't know what they're doing. Try VEX 042. I, I just don't think that really, like, I think we're kind of, we're, I don't think we're getting anywhere on this. You know what I mean? I don't think we're, we're I don't think this changes. My, okay, it does change a little bit. I don't. Is that because this thing has the same, uh, this thing has the same behavior? Does this thing have the same behavior as new, except for when it's first pushed to it? Then it makes its first initial alloc a first initial push become allocation that sets its size to forty two. We know that I have a faster PC. I do have a faster PC. Uh, the compiler must ensure that destructors are called an appropriate time, for, uh, which for Rust is when a value goes out of scope. In the recursion function, the vect has a destructor that needs to be ran after each function call. This means the function stack frame can't be uh, discarded or overwritten as it required for tail call optimization. I am very curious. Like, is that is that true? Like, are we seeing something that's true? Because you know, the obviously you guys, the audience, uh, have. 
shown something different, that it may be a misunderstanding that's going on here. How do I know these things are happening? Um, uh, let guarantees a stack allocation in Rust. What uh, there my uh, there are magic. So now I'm I'm just curious how Mojo, what they're doing differently, right? Uh, anyways, we can just move on. Uh, as is required for tail call optimizations, because Mojo destructs early, uh, it doesn't have this limitation and is able to optimize with TCO, even with heap allocated objects. I wonder if there's other ways you could kind of test this with Rust with heap allocated objects and expecting of destructors and all that kind of stuff being called, such that you're able to get out these results in a meaningful way, right? Uh, this is 126x the result from my M2 Mac. Give it a try yourself. If you don't have Mojo, you can install it here. Why does... Okay, so can we just do a quick quick question? Why does my multi-year-old Lemur Pro apparently produce results twice as fast as whatever the hell is going on here? What is going on here? Uh, conclusion. We all love a Rust app modular, and we are inspired by it. The tooling is great. The tooling is great. The tooling is fantastic. Install Mojo right now. I don't want to install Mojo right now. And it currently has one of the best high-level ergonomics for any system programming language. Absolutely. This is probably the most true statement ever been uttered. Absolutely. It, Rust, for being a systems-level language, is feels like a high-level language in a lot of cases. Right? There's also SIMD for Rust. Yeah, but I, if I remember, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dehydrated Mango, um, SIMD for Rust is much more cumbersome. Uh, but it has pointed two out major problems in the field of AI. Uh, it compiles slow, and AI is about experimentation and rapid iteration. Most AI researchers are experienced with Python, won't take the time to learn a new language from scratch. I completely agree with these two things. Uh, magicians, uh, but you're the Rust wizard, that's why. Uh, members of our team uh, tried to solve this problem uh, with Swift for TensorFlow at Google, which didn't catch on due to the issues mentioned with AI researchers not willing to learn a brand new, slower compiled language. Interesting. This is actually like, this, uh, this point I find actually to be the most compelling or interesting part of the entire article, is that at Google, I mean, Google's a weird place. I'm not saying Google's fantastic, but the fact that they struggled to get people to make changes and that Google was using Swift for TensorFlow. All right, two is also an argument against uh, Mojo. Uh, I, it's hard for me to say it's an argument against Mojo in the sense that it's, it's, it's mostly Python. All right, it's mostly Python. And so you're already like, if you're already at 85% understanding the language, then that's not a huge jump. If you could, if you could 100x Python's performance, let's just call it 100x. I know it's not 100x, but if you could, if you could 100x Python, and you had to learn 15% more syntax to do it, but keep everything else about Python the same, would you do it? Of course, everyone's gonna do it, right? That make it literally would make no sense, right? It's like TypeScript. TypeScript is literally the same argument. Would you want? to add 15% more syntax to your JavaScript, but get notified when your dumbass thinks you're using something that's a string, but it can also be an undefined. Yeah, we're all dumbasses. Of course we want that. Now, me personally, I use, I use a JS doc, which is like 40% more syntax, but you get the idea. Geico can even save you 15%. No, base got, I use, I use a JS doc, not TypeScript, because I'm actually based. Uh, yeah, uh, free, free your build pipeline, stop using... TypeScript. Anyways, members of our team tried to solve this problem uh, with Swift at Google, blah, 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 blah. We love Python, uh, C++, Rust, Swift, Julia, etc. But over the decade of the industry hill climbing these technologies, we believe that a fresh start with Mojo embodies the only way to make a dent in these age-old problems. Mojo has already optimal performance for system engineers, but still has a long way to go for all the dynamic features that Python programmers expect. Optimal performance for system engineers? Maybe the phrase would be, like, good enough. So easy a caveman can do it. Shut up. Optimal is kind of, you know, optimal might be a little a little aggressive in this situation. Uh, maybe it has optimal ergonomics and performance cross-section. Right? 
Rust is an excellent choice if you need to put something into production right now. Uh, if you're curious and looking towards the future and want to be early with a language that could be instrumental in the next 50 years of AI, give Mojo a try. We'll be adding AI-specific libraries to the package that comes with Mojo soon, which will uh, which we're working on as the killer app to show the world what Mojo can do. Keep an eye out for Max in the coming weeks. Uh, Netflix used to have something called Max. We killed Max. So son of a bitch, Max got taken out to pasture. I believe it's on the PlayStation only, PlayStation Three, something like that. Anyways, uh. Bunning. Bunning worked on it. Great guy, by the way. Love that guy at, at Netflix. Um, I'm curious if Mojo will go like the Go route and have a really strong standard library. Because that's what it kind of sounds like, is that they're they're creating an environment for you to have everything you need. Like with Go, effectively with Go, you could write a web server with 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 zero dependencies. Like it's actually possible for you to write a web server with no dependencies, and it will be reasonably pretty good. So, like, can that happen with this? I don't know. Kind of neat. Okay, shut up about my hair, okay? We'd love to see. You guys did this to me. Uh, you did it to me. Uh, we'd love to see you in the Mojo community. Here are some links to get you started. There you go. Anyways, um, I actually like this. This is a great article. This is a great article. Uh, I liked what they were trying to talk about and the things they were trying to say. Uh, the pin thing is kind of an interesting one because this is more just like, this is purely skill issue. This is purely skill issue, right? Uh, and I suffer from this 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 particular skill issue of Rust. Um, and so, very interesting. This is a very interesting thing here. Um, I'm curious how much this makes a difference and if if this is something that that rust is in the process of quote unquote transferring to or whatever like is it actually that much better to the point where everyone is going to be adopting this over the next so much time because if this is the case where it's like this is going to become the new standard then it's not really like an argument for why this thing is good it's just good right now does that make sense it's good now it's not good forever this is not a competitive advantage uh Assuming that MLIR is open source and every you know everyone's moving, there's there's a lot of assumptions going on there. I do like the SIMD ergonomics though. That seems really exciting. Come to Brazil, I am going to Brazil. Anyways, okay. Hey, good job, Mojo. Keep on. Don't lose your mojo, okay, Austin Powers. I mean. She, uh, I was in a discord with some, uh, larger streamers and someone mentioned Brazil. And so then I did the classic Brazil meme with Brazil mentioned, and then nobody said anything about it. And I felt stupid. <laughs>